It's Law and Order, special GOP unit. Hi, I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle now. And Bill, Republicans, as we record this, have unveiled uh, their plan in the U.S. Senate, uh, led by Senator Tim Scott, um, to address the issues around police brutality and racial inequality in law enforcement across the country. Uh, the controversy, or seeming key point of controversy, between the Senate GOP plan and the House Democrat plan is whether the federal government will require things or encourage things, in this case, uh, chokeholds and reporting to a national database. And uh, there was one other uh, aspect of it that slips, oh, uh, certain kinds of no-knock warrants. Um, Bill, this is a this is a fascinating approach for a Republican, especially. We talked about this on an episode of Right Angle this week, which folks can see at uh, BillWhittle.com. But uh, Republicans are now coming forward and basically saying, using the purse strings of federal funding, uh, they want local police forces to uh, to ban chokeholds, to require them to report officer-involved deaths and other kinds of police misconduct to a federal uh, database, the officer-involved deaths to the FBI. Um, is there a substantive difference, Bill, between uh, dangling the federal money and saying you don't get it if you don't play ball and what the Democrats are saying, which is essentially to nationalize that law and say it's a federal violation uh, to do a, a chokehold? Well, yes, there is a difference. One of them is volitional and the other one uh, uses coercion. Uh, this is the fundamental difference between two different ideas of, of government. And could, could you explore that a little more? Because I don't think that's instantly obvious to people because this is a national wave of protest and people look at it and say, this is a national news story. The president is talking about it. Our national legislators are talking about it. Um, why is it that we shouldn't, as the United States of America, make a clear statement that says we ban these practices that everybody acknowledges are over the top? Well, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's a bad idea. Um, I was just explaining the difference between the two uh, systems. Uh, a coercional system is one where it says you will do this, and and the other one is one where it say if you do this, then we'll give you that. Um, the the ri the risk of increasing any centralizing power in the federal government is always extremely high, and and therefore it's something. Uh, uh, first, first of all, I don't think there should be any opening up of new powers or anything like that. But when the federal government decides to get involved on something on a, on a national level, uh, I think that it needs to be something that is something that is so universally agreed upon that it goes beyond the entire idea of federalism in, in the sense that, well, people in San Francisco shouldn't tell people in you know Montgomery how to live and vice versa. Um, if there is if there is nationwide consensus on this, uh, more or less, and there seems to be, then you have to ask yourself if it turns out that if if it was volitional and a police department elected not to enforce those uh, those rule changes on um, on chokeholds, and then somebody were to die as a result of those chokeholds, it it does open up a a line of criticism about governance in general. Now I'm walking a, f a pretty fine tightrope on this one. Uh, we never know what the question's gonna be on the show before I get it. And anytime I talk about anything on a federal level, I always find out that there's uh, arguments that are, that are made, uh, that are extremely um, valuable and cogent, uh, pretty much saying what I'm, about, what I'm about to say is wrong. But in this case, my gut feeling is, and my considered feeling as well for that matter, is that there are times when, when the national federal leadership needs to make these kind of actions as a sign of national purpose. And first things first, I am relieved and, and, and frankly surprised uh, in a good way to hear that Republicans are trying to get ahead on this issue. And um, but but my main my main reason for being relatively sanguine about this is that it is coming from the legislature and it is not another one of these executive orders which have become 
dictates. Uh, I well, know the that president did make an executive order the other day, uh, just this yep. same week, and that echoed, or this echoes, uh, some of the same concepts, which is basically let's use federal funding to uh, discourage the use of chokeholds, let's do more police training and things like that. I have a national database to report um, these kinds of brutality incidents. Uh, so, so President Trump did that, but now they're following it up essentially with uh, legislation uh, emanating from the Senate GOP, but also from the House Democrats. Well, legislation is the way to do these things. Th this is the entire this is the entire structure of our system of government. I think by now it's pretty clear I'm a Donald Trump supporter, and and the trouble that we have gotten into over the course of 50 years in terms of abandoning the Constitution. Uh, we've had this argument and wrestled with this issue many times. Uh, the idea that 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 sometimes when you're fighting against a dishonorable enemy, you, you no longer have the option to play by the Marquis of Queensbury rules. With that said, I would like to see all executive orders return to what they were originally supposed to be, which is, hey, we need another two staffers in the White House kitchen. Do we really need to pass legislation for this? It is no longer used for that, just like the Commerce Clause. It has become a blanket by which to, to basically rule by fiat. Um, and I'm against that regardless of who the president is. Now, the fact that the, the the legislation, the fact that it's coming from legislative branch is good. The, the real question, I guess, the reason we're talking about it is, is this something that we should enforce nationally? And I'm trying to think of reasons why we shouldn't. Um, and I and I can't come up with any right at the moment. So in a way, uh, this is kind of federalizing some things that used to be handled on the local level, but people who are advocates for civil rights and, and uh, equal justice uh, have argued for a long time that despite the progress that may have been made uh, since the civil rights movement, there are pockets of injustice in this country. And if there is not a federal law to handle this, then locals will have the same prerogatives that they did, for example, in the Jim Crow era, where local uh, requirements were being enforced or ignored, uh, despite whatever federal law was saying, and the federal government refused to step in. So you're saying we've gotten to the point where it's time for the federal government to step in because of these pockets of injustice, or did you have another reason? No, no, I think, well, I have a couple reasons, but it, that is exactly the example I went to when you first asked me the question and I began my uh, serious cogitation on the issue. Uh, the, the civil rights movements, when Democratic governors were turning fire hoses on, on black kids trying to go to college uh, and setting dogs on them and, and all of the Jim, Jim Crow racism that was a result of the, the, the basically the Democratic control after the after Reconstruction was over and Republicans were basically thrown out and set us back a hundred years. Um, all of those laws, you could argue, were within the purview of the state or the city. You could, you could make that argument from a federalist point of view, and generally speaking, it's a pretty good argument to make. But when you're talking about something that, that affects the actual lives of people, and you're not talking about uh, a mechanism of government so much of governance so much as you are talking now about protections that are that are that are guaranteed to American citizens by God and 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 not restrained by the by the Constitution. You do have to ask yourself: Is this an appropriate place for the United States Constitution to exert itself? and say that, no, we're not talking about federalism here. This isn't an issue of how much you want to spend on your school board, which we have no business telling you about, and we have no business having a Department of Education for that matter. But now we're talking about, uh, we're talking about an issue that impacts the lives of all Americans. You can make an argument, I think, from a, from a philosophical point of view that since it impacts all Americans, the idea that there would be pockets where this kind of protections don't exist anymore, uh, is is a little fallacious one. And, and I think a, a really good example of this, by the way, for those of you who, who as I do, incline towards the federalist view, um, when it became clear uh, with the Miranda case that uh, police officers had to read you your, your rights and inform you that you had the right to remain silent, right to an attorney, and so on, that didn't just apply in certain states and not apply in others. That applied nationwide. And it applied nationwide because it was perceived, I think, appropriately so, as a form of increasing the protection of individuals and, and furthering the presumption of innocence and, and all of these Fifth Amendment uh, arguments against uh, self-incrimination and so on. So 
the fact that the Miranda rights, reading Miranda rights, was not something that was just issue. You have to read them in, in New Hampshire and, and, and Ohio. No, you, this, is, this is policy now. When you deal with something that impacts every American's life, I think you can make a good enough case to say that this is in the federal national interest of the United States of America to make these kind of things mandatory, despite the fact that I have tremendous reservations about that kind of thing. I, flexibility and, and ability, look, whenever you argue the absolute polar extremes, the federal government should never, ever, ever tell the states what to do, or the federal government should always tell the states what to do. Whenever you go to those polls and stand there, reality will come and mock you. And, and the beautiful thing about our system of government, the beautiful thing about the Constitution is that it's based on reality. And I think this is one of those cases where the structure of our government, we have a, we have a three-part government three ways. We have the judicial branch, the executive branch, and the legislative branch. We also have the federal government, the state governments, and then the local governments. And these are designed to, to break up power. I'm in favor of all of this, but there are times when, when that, when that hierarchy is important and my First Amendment rights don't change when I go from one state to another. They change if you come to California, but we're talking about America here. Um, and, and I think this is a I think you can make a compelling case for this being mandatory. So uh, it sounded like at the beginning of this, and I'm kind of rewinding the video in my head here as we do it in real time, it sounded like at the beginning you were somewhat critical of Democrats always wanting to mandate things and saying that Republicans were smart to try to invite people and induce people to do it. And now it sounds like you're saying that you'd rather support in general principle the House Democrat bill, not every codicil of it, but that concept of requirement from the federal level rather rather than merely invitation from the federal level. You could probably say that's a fair statement. I would, I, I would say that in this particular, look, one of the problems with the world being as, the, the country being as polarized as it is, and we've discussed this recently quite a bit, is that if, if, if a, a liberal comes out and says murder is wrong, things have become so polarized that our initial immediate reaction is, no, it's not, you know? But just because somebody says something with people, just because somebody we routinely disagree with says something doesn't automatically make it bad ideas. That's just the way to bet. Um, in, in this case, I think that you could make a compelling argument for this being mandatory. And to give you yet another uh, uh, analogy of how, of how these things work, at least for me, I personally feel that the single greatest impediment to, to really uh, well, I can't think of anything that's right off the top of my head more pernicious than regulations. These these endless regulations that are written by non-elected officials, and they just keep choking, 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 choking out businesses opportunities, and, and that affects the economy, and so on, and so on, and so on. So as a general rule, I am an anti-regulation guy in a big way, but I also am a big fan of regulations regarding airline maintenance, for example. And I know enough about history and especially about aviation history to know that when these things are left in the gray area, as much as I would not like to believe so, airlines, especially when they're struggling, will cut those corners and people have died as a result of that. So those kind of regulations I'm in favor of. I'm in favor of regulations that stop a guy from taking a cement mixer and dumping uh, mercury into the Kern River. Um, that kind of thing is reasonable. And so now we're discussing at what point does the exception to the general rule kick in? And the general rule is the federal government should, should leave the states and the, and the local governments alone. There is no federal police force and good. Um, but we are now talking about what I think you could make a compelling case for. You are now talking about um, equal protection issues and you're talking about uh, you're talking about issues that go to the fundamental, fundamental responsibility of government. The primary responsibility of government is to protect the lives and the property of its citizens. And, and to the degree that these kind of abuses have continued, I think you could make a case that this is something that the federal, federal government should insist on doing, even if the local governments don't. And by the way, by the way, this exact same argument, exact same argument, 
is why I am so utterly opposed to this entire idea of sanctuary cities. And I think most conservatives are definitively opposed to the idea that a city like San Francisco can say, well, you can have national immigration laws all you want to, but they don't apply here in San Francisco. I find that repulsive, repugnant, and I think it needs to be dealt with. And so that's a case where the federal government needs to step in and say, I don't care what the city government says. I don't care what the mayor says. You don't get to declare San Francisco or the central part of Seattle to no longer be part of the United States of America. That exceeds your responsibility on the local level. And now the big boy is going to have to come in and, and, and basically make you play by the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, this is part one of a two-part Bill Whittle Now. Bill's just finding that out at the moment. Uh, but we oh look at this topic as such a serious and broad topic that we're actually going to devote two episodes back to back, day after day. So uh, once you're done watching this one, um, then be ready for the next one, which will come out the next day. Now, if it's been several days from now, then you can watch them, binge watch them two in a row. Uh, but in any case, this kind of serious discussion is made possible by the members of BillWhittle.com who are actually funding it and running their own website. They've got a blog, they've got a vigorous comment section, and it's a great place for people who are constitutionalists, liberty lovers, to hang out, get to know one another, and advance the great ideas that have made this republic possible. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.